Hi, my name's Kevin Hicks. Welcome to the History Squad. Now, today's video has been voted in by my Patreon members. Hey guys, thanks a million. It's all about law and order and punishment in the medieval times. So without further ado, let's have a little look. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'm a retired police officer. I was a British bobby on the beach just outside of West London many years ago. Now, before then, I was in the Royal Military Police and I was an MP. Now, both training for those jobs, you had to learn the law. And I've never forgotten both colleges. The, one of the first things they told us when we were learning the law is, you've got to go back to Saxon times. You must understand about English common law. And that's where we're going, to the Saxon times, common law. Now, some of the crimes that you'd come across in the medieval times, quite straightforward. Drunk, drunk and disorderly, disorderly conduct, poaching, thieving. And then you get to the more serious of treason, heresy, murder. And you've got to ask yourself is, how was the rule of law maintained in those days? First of all, they divided up the country. You had a thing called a tithing. So groups of 10 families, that's a tithing. And the man in charge of that, the the tithe man, he was responsible for that little group of people and minor crimes that were committed, they would sort it out. But then if you group those together, you will then end up with the hundred and the hundredsman. He would deal with the more serious crimes. And then above that, you have the Shire, this entire area of England. My home Shires, I've got two, Staffordshire and Warwickshire. Now, on top, in charge of those, will be the Shire Reeve. We know that as the sheriff. And he was responsible for the more serious crimes. And he worked for the king. So he was the connection to royalty. Now, if you committed a crime way back in the medieval times and you had it on your toes, you escaped. But there'd been witnesses. They saw who it was. The local constable, the sheriff, the Shire Reeve, or even the hundredsman. They would raise a hue and a cry. That is, they would gather local people and they had to obey, do their service, and they would chase down the criminal. This could be an extended chase that actually leaves the Shire and goes into another one. They had to pursue that person, the hue and cry. Another name for that is actually Posse. And I love that because the old Western movies, the Sheriff, we're going to raise a Posse. It actually comes from the medieval England. It's a hue and a cry. So this whole business of tithings, hundreds, people being responsible for the law at a community level, I like that because it worked. But then, 1066, the Normans came and they didn't quite know what to do with the law. So they had to study Saxon law. And this is where it all, in a way, kind of changes. So with the coming of the Normans, they brought with them uh, the stronger church. They built their cathedrals. And these cathedrals, this power of the church, they had their own courts. But if you were a, a nobleman, a wealthy man, powerful, you can read, you can write. You've committed a crime, a serious crime, could even be murder. You could claim benefit of clergy. You could claim that you are actually a religious man, a member of the church. Some of them even shaved the top of their head, a tonce there, and pass themselves off as members of the clergy. And the clergy itself had no way of proving or disproving that they were members of the church. But what this did was it put them under the control or under the protection of the church, and they would be tried by an ecclesiastical court. The death penalty would actually be off the table. The ecclesiastical courts were far more lenient than the criminal courts of England. So there's a bit of friction here between the church and the king. The king is pursuing people. Maybe the sheriff of Nottingham, he's been a naughty, naughty boy. He has it on his toes and he decides that he's going to hide in a church sanctuary. You can't get him. He might even shave the top of his head into a tonce so that he looks like a monk. They couldn't disprove whether he was a monk or not. So there was building friction. Also, if you were caught as a criminal, it was how you were put on trial in the early years. So the Normans have arrived, they're learning about the law, a guy has been caught thieving. To prove his innocence, trial by ordeal. So 
you plunge his hand into a boiling cauldron of water. You then take it out, bandage it up. And within three days, if his hand has begun to heal nicely, he's obviously innocent. His hand's still boiled, but he's innocent. You give him an iron bar that's been heated up to hold for, was it nine seconds, I believe, or so many paces, and then he lets it go. Bandage up the hand if it begins to heal in three days. It's a sign of his innocence. Or drop him in a massive vat of water. If he sinks, he's innocent. If he floats, he's guilty. Have you ever tried to sink yourself in a swimming pool? You always come back to the surface, don't you? The air in your lungs. So the church had to monitor these ordeals, these trial by ordeals. But of course, if you're a bit of a nobleman, a knight, or even a man at arms, you're up there, you could choose to be tried by combat. And the winner was obviously chosen by God, and therefore he is innocent, and the guy who's lying dead on the floor was guilty, or it was a false call. This is early medieval. But as I mentioned, there's a bit of friction between the crown and the church when it comes to this legal side, the giving of sanctuary, these church courts being so lenient. Thomas Becket and the king, Henry II, that is one of the famous flashpoints of this time. But I'm not going to go into that because that's going to be a, a whole separate film. But it just shows you how the crown and the church would clash. And it was the Pope actually stopped the business of the church being involved with the trial by ordeal. So now they had to come up with a new way of doing things, and it will be trial by jury. And how are they going to do that? Because what actually develops is quite interesting. Up until 1176, which is over 100 years after the Battle of Hastings and the Norman invasion of Britain, law was still administered by your local lord or your communities. But now... Royal judges are being sent out to the shires. <laughs> and people were terrified of them. Can you imagine you're in a little village and all of a sudden, yes, yeah, there's a, a judge is coming from the king. Why? What have we done wrong? Well, in 1233, there was a village in Cornwall got the news. The judge is coming. They were so terrified that they, the entire village had it on their toes and hid in the woods until the judge was gone. You see, people were afraid of this new kind of law, not so much of the judge, but the idea of being tried by a jury. Twelve good men and true and all of that. People didn't trust it. What if the jury doesn't like you? What if they've got an axe to grind? And so people, when they were brought up in front of the judge, right, how do you plead? They'd go, I'm not going to. And it was a big problem. Well, you've got to. No, I haven't. Now, I covered this in a previous video about Margaret Clitheroe, God rest her soul, that if you didn't plead either guilty or not guilty, you would be put to strong, hard punishment. Piene forte et dure. What it meant was this, that they took the front door off your house, lay you down, often with a stone up against your spine, and then they put rocks on top until you either pleaded, okay, okay, I'm guilty, or no, I'm not guilty, put you to trial, or you simply burst. It was serious business, this trial by jury. So right in the middle of all of this changing of judicial procedure in England, going from trial by ordeal to trial by jury, in June 1215, you have the signing of the Magna Carta at Runnymede down there, not far from Windsor. Now, it's interesting because some people say, oh, this was just a charter for the rich, for the barons. Well, four clauses out of the 63, if I remember correctly, are still on the statute books of English law. Now, two of them in particular are very poignant, uh, 39 and 40. I'm going to read this. No free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, not in any way proceeded against, except by the lawful judgment of his peers and the law of the land. And the other one, clause 40, no one will we sell, to no one will we deny or delay right or justice. 
These are so vitally important. So the laws in the medieval time, many of them were left over from the Saxon times. And of course, your serious crimes uh, like murder, treason, um, theft. But there was one, coin clipping. If you were clipping the silver off the edge of the coins to melt it down and make other coins, that was regarded as treason. And you will be hanged and burned for that. Uh, it, had, it was so important, actually, they changed the design on the coins. They used to have a very short cross, but this one here has got a long cross. So you can tell if it's been clipped. A very serious crime. But also you got your ecclesiastical crimes, crimes against the church, heresy and blasphemy, all of these. But the king himself added new laws by royal decree. In 1198, King Richard I banned, outlawed the hunting of the royal deer in the royal forest. If you were caught... The punishment was severe. It was blinding and castration. So they cut off your genitals. But blinding, hot iron against the eyes would melt the eyes. Another one I'd read about was a hairy rope wound against the face, and that would actually pull the eyes out. That's absolutely horrendous. People were terrified. Uh, in 1209, there was Hugh the Scot had been caught, but he ran away, having poached the king's deer in the royal forest. And he hid in a church claiming sanctuary. And he stayed there, I believe, for about a month until he was able to slip out disguised as a woman. And then on his toes he had. Now, this punishment was very, very uh, unpopular. And in 1217, the punishment was reduced to a year and a day in prison and a hefty old fine. So it's interesting, isn't it, how these laws affect people? Because some of those royal decrees are actually still standing. To this very day, England, Wales, I'm not sure about Scotland, actually, you are not allowed to catch a sturgeon or a whale because they are the property of the king or the queen. And in 2004, a Welsh fisherman, bless his cotton socks, was fishing away and he caught a sturgeon and was told, you can't keep that, that's the royal fish. So I don't know whether he put it in the freezer or what he did, but he contacted the palace in London there, Buckingham Palace, and offered the sturgeon to the Queen. But Queen Elizabeth, God rest her soul, she politely declined the offer. So it just goes to show how the laws of the ancient day still affect us to this very day. Uh, football was banned for years because of archery practice. If you were caught playing football instead of going to archery practice, that's six days in jail. And one that I really love is the weights and measures bakers. If they sold you a loaf, a penny loaf that was underweight, he could be fined and pilloried. And I'll talk about the pillories in a minute. So bakers were very nervous about, oh, what if we short change? So there's a famous saying, isn't it? A baker's dozen. Because a baker would bake a dozen rolls and then he would add an extra one. 13 is a baker's dozen just in case his weight was wrong. So some of the laws were a little bit interesting, a bit strange. I like the one for the archers, that if you shot somebody on the archery range as they were crossing and you were shooting, tough luck on them. You're safe. Now, there's one set of laws that actually blow your mind when you look back. They're called the sumptuous laws. And these were designed to keep people in their social status. If you're a poor guy, Keeps you down there. Middle class, it'll keep you there. Upper class, hey. And it was all about, first of all, what you wore. Colours, certain colours you were not allowed to wear. Purple is one of them. Fur trim you're not allowed to wear unless you're of a certain class. But this didn't apply to soldiers who were in service of their noble lords. So they could display the different colours. And actually when they were armoured up and going to war, these laws did not apply to them at all. But then he went further. It's the cut of cloth, the type of cloth. A poor man, if he got some silk, he's not allowed to wear it. But then fashions got a bit outlandish and long, pointy shoes. Some of the medieval shoes were so long and pointy that they had to fasten them to their shins or to their knees. And what this was was people showing off. I can afford to have all of this leather in my shoe. Look at this. And then they had the cod piece, which is the piece that covers the gentlemanly parts, shall we say. Now, normally... There's enough room to put in those gentlemanly parts. 
But uh, young blades, they wanted to have them bigger, extend them. Well, it was ridiculous. So they fell foul of the sumptuous laws. But one of them that I really do love was the indecent tunic. Now, one of the problems being a medieval man was your clothes. They didn't have suspenders or braces, as we call them in the UK. Uh, your belts would often slip. So your hose, your pants, were laced in to a vest, basically. Uh, but then if you want to go for a poop and you're in a hurry, you've got to undo the laces from behind. And I will tell you from bitter experience, it's not easy to do. So they left the back of their hose, their pants, undone. Invariably, just made of wool, they will sag down. Their linen shirts would sag up. So the law required that you have a long tunic to cover that up. If I understand correctly, there was a fine at one stage. If you showed your wobbly bottom in public, that's half a crown fine. And I think that is brilliant. And perhaps there should be a fine in Walmart for wobbly bottoms being exposed, because I've seen a few, if you want the truth. Now, another part of this is 1336, Edward III. He was very conscious of gluttony how the lower orders were enjoying lots of food. So he actually passed a law that you can only have two courses during the course of a meal, uh, except at holidays like Christmas and Easter, then you could feast as much as you like. It was always the attempt of those up there trying to keep those down there in their place. But it was, who was it who actually went to catch you? Me as a police officer, I was a constable. So, the sheriff, the shire reef, he will have a bailiff. The bailiff will go and collect the fines and forfeits, all of that kind of thing. The constable, at first that was just a, a volunteer thing for about a year, I think. But then later on, you could be employed as the constable. That will last for five years. And his job was to pursue the criminals. Now, just interestingly, if you were summoned to appear at court, you'd pleaded, yeah, I'm not guilty and they issue you a summons, and you have it on your toes, you're outlaw. You're outside the law. You can be captured, you can be killed. Now, outlaw is very interesting, because an outlaw was regarded, was it I read, that imagine they have the head of a wolf, you can cut it off, because they are outside of the law. And that's when we kind of loop in with the barons, the, the nasty ones, the sheriff of Nottingham. They would often employ soldiers, men who were outside of the law, and they would use those men as their hired thugs. And it, the more I read about it, the more I realise that it was the poor people who used to get robbed the most. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? The poor people are the ones who get robbed the most. So what punishments did they have in the medieval times? You've been arrested, you're found guilty by trial, you're going to be punished now. Now, in the early medieval times, if you committed murder, you can uh, get away by paying a hefty fine, which I find interesting because they were more interested in your money than they were in the punishment. But as the medieval period goes on, there are more and more people. So the punishments, you can be pressed if you do not plead. If you clip a coin, it's treason. And the law wanted to make an example of you. So the punishment was quite severe. It could consist of you being hung, drawn, quartered, or hung, and then burned. Some people would prefer you to be burned alive because it was regarded as one of the most serious crimes. If you have committed murder, straightforward thing, they will hang you. Now, apparently, each village and town had a gallows just outside of the entrance. It might just be a hanging tree, or it may actually be a gallows. Outside of Warwick, they used to have Gallows Hill, where the gallows actually stood. But these two, I find interesting, the stocks and the pillory. Now, the stocks were used for lesser crimes, such as being drunk and disorderly. They were a form of humiliation. The stocks often had wheels, so the stocks would be wheeled out into the middle of the market square, where most of the people were. You'd be sat in there, you can't escape, and the locals could have a good old laugh and jeer at you. Now, these were still in use in my county of Warwickshire till the mid-19th century, but they had to have a constable on duty to safeguard you. 
But if you were pilloried, your head and your arms are actually trapped and you are at the mercy of the crowd. And many a person who was put in the stocks was killed because they would pelt you with rotten fruit. Well, that's what you see in the films, isn't it? This is the medieval times. Are you going to have very much rotten vegetables or are they just going to eat it before it goes rotten? How about throwing a brick at him? Because that's what used to happen. This could actually be a bit of a death sentence. Also, if I just turn it round, it was a backbreaker. If you were in there for too long, your back really did hurt. Branding was another punishment you might suffer as a criminal in the medieval times, together with dismembering, such as having your ear or your nose cut off, or your hand if you were a thief, and even your tongue cut out, or maybe being blinded or castrated. It's terrible when you think about it, isn't it? Now, you imagine you're a nobleman. You've got a castle, you've got several castles. You commit a crime. You're found guilty of the jury there, you naughty boy. But you can actually pay to the crown, a hefty old fine. Or if it's such a great fine, you can actually give a parcel of land to the crown or to the church. That's actually what they preferred because they're making money. But if you come down the line a little bit to the poor old farmer and he's committed a crime, he's got no land to give over. He's a tenant. He's got no money in the bank. He cannot afford to pay a fine. So he's going to pay through pain. He's going to be punished. He's going to feel the full weight of the law. If he's stolen, he's going to lose a hand, ears, nose, branding, all of those terrible, terrible things. And that makes me realize that in those days, for sure, there was one rule for the rich, one rule for the poor. And when I think about it, I don't think that's actually changed today, do you? One rule for them, one rule for us. Well, I hope you enjoyed our little video there on law and order and a little bit of punishment in the medieval times. If you did, like, share and subscribe. And if you'd like to support our channel further, have a look at our Patreon community. The link is in the description. Now, before I go, a quick shout out to some of our Patreon members. Now, I always read these out so I don't get them wrong. Here we go. Thanks to Chris Michael, Dan DiCenso and Martin Hans. Hey, guys. Thanks a million. Bye for now.